Ellis here with part 193 of the My Docket series on child custody and visitation. As in my previous videos, I'll take this opportunity to direct my viewers to part zero if you haven't seen it yet. That's the video that contains the detailed disclaimers and the underlying purpose of the series. Two things that I will glaze over are, number one, I'm not in the middle of this right now. My case is completely and totally over. It's closed. It cannot be reopened, and that's because my ex parental rights have been terminated. Number two, the nutshell version as to the purpose of the series is to give my viewers one big example of my eight-year-long high-conflict child custody ordeal from beginning to end in chronological order. We go now into the court's order denying motion for order to show cause. Um, I was definitely, going into my mindset, I was definitely frustrated and annoyed by the court's order. The basis for the denial was that she felt that the affidavit wasn't consistent with Awad v. Wright, and I felt like it was consistent with it, but I had two decisions, really. One is file an appeal, or just put another affidavit in there and file a motion again. And I decided to go ahead and use the latter, and um, I did end up getting relief. The next time around when she saw that i had filed a renewed motion with a more detailed affidavit i guess you could say i feel like the first affidavit was just fine i don't understand what she was talking about but i can't read her mind i can't get into her head and so i can either go through the appellate process which is going to take longer or i can just comply with her demand and file another affidavit so anyway let's actually go ahead now at this point and take a look at what the judge has filed. Here we have the court's um, order denying motion for order to show cause. Shocker, right? I think the order denying motion for the order to show cause is probably the most common order denying in any uh, family court system. If you want to know more about why contempt of court is such a huge problem, watch the video that published on Saturday. I think it was titled Contempt of Family Court. And um, there's a attor family attorney in Utah named Derek Johnson who explains precisely why the family courts have this issue. Anyway, um, standard introductory paragraph indicating that the courts reviewed all the documents and uh, has decided to order as follows. Findings of fact, again, findings of fact without any evidentiary hearing. Okay. Uh, anyway, all this, most of this stuff is ancient. So, I mean, she's making findings on stuff from years ago. I mean, she's not really making findings now as much as she's citing findings from forever ago. But um, where parents of a minor child, um, that my ex has been ordered to pay me a certain amount of child support subject to wage garnishment that she has to communicate through our family wizard. Uh, let's see here. I'm alleging my ex has refused to pay child support, has failed to return clothing at every exchange thus far, um, but she's ordered to pay child. I can't believe I'm going through this. The child support contempt is like, it's a waste of everyone's time. She should have just let me proceed with the debtor's exam and the execution and asset seizure. So once again, the judge creating mountains of extra work for herself, while at the same time, I'm sure complaining about how much work she has. The point of the execution process is to not disturb the court. That's why the legislature set forth a process that does not require constant supervision by the judge. That's the point of the process. And here we have a family court judge who's like, no, you can't use that process. File contempt motions, which I'll then deny, a bunch of times over and over again, which I'll then complain about, only to, in the end, enter a decision on the alternative relief requested. And we'll talk about that when I actually offer it to the court. But I, I, later on, I offered the court a way to resolve the motion without holding a hearing because it's obvious she doesn't want to hold a hearing um, because she's got way too much work that she's creating for herself, at least part of it, that she's unnecessarily creating for herself. But anyway, if she would have not done the stuff that she did that leads to two different appeals and two different orders reversing that are going to impugn her record... She wouldn't have had to deal with another multitude of contempt motions. Yet another example of family court judges creating 10 times more work for themselves that they didn't need to create. So I'm going through all of the, the, the money that my ex isn't paying, which I told the judge she wouldn't pay. Thousands and thousands of dollars building up again. And let's see what she has to say about that. So she goes through all of the dollar amounts, the uniforms, and all of this crazy stuff. Next assertion is... 
then my ex's attorney responds saying that he's been unable to communicate with my ex despite repeated attempts to do so. <laughs> Um, on reply, I'm alleging that she's unwilling or unable to communicate with counsel, that the opposition filed fails to directly controvert the asserted facts, DCR 13.3 controls. Uh, conclusions of law, DCR 13.3 allows the court to construe, an, uh, uh, to construe the lack of opposition as an admission that my motion is meritorious and a consent to granting it. Um, there's strong judicial policy favoring decisions based on the merits of the case. Policies heightened in domestic relations matters. The court will not consider my ex's as, as my the court will not consider my ex's opposition as an admission on the part of her that my motion is meritorious. Um, the law defines contempt as disobedience to any lawful writ. That the order has to be clear and unambiguous. The courts have the inherent power to enforce her decrees. That if contempt is not committed within the immediate view and presence of the court, that an affidavit has to be presented to the court. And that I failed to provide a fact-specific affidavit attesting to the grounds for contempt. So this is this is a lie. If you guys go back and check my motion for order to show cause, you'll see an affidavit in there and you'll see that it's very detailed. So the affidavit has been provided. It is detailed. And the judge is claiming that that's not good enough. But she doesn't say why. So I imagine that something like this I could have appealed and got another order reversing against this judge. But all I end up doing is just filing another motion with another affidavit. And at that point in time, I get the relief I'm requesting. Um, certificate of electronic service indicating this document was mailed to both me and my ex and her attorney. And that's it. Going into the aftermath, I didn't file anything, so I incurred $0 in costs. My ex didn't file anything, so she incurred $0 in costs. I didn't have an attorney, so I incurred $0 in attorney fees. I doubt my ex's attorney would have put any work into this at all. It doesn't resolve anything, and it doesn't do anything in his favor. Later on, I'm going to end up filing another motion anyway, and we're going to go through that all over again. And the, the judge will eventually, at that point in time, realizing I'm not just going to go away, finally give me the relief that I'm requesting. They make it as difficult as they possibly can to protect the child. I don't understand it, but I mean, like going through this, it's even making me go a little bit crazy. It's even triggering me, but I can't imagine what you guys are going through as you're watching over and over again, the court making it as hard as they possibly can for you to protect a child. It's, it's, it's the opposite. Like they should actually be trying to facilitate the child protection process, or they could at least be passive and just like let it happen. But instead, it's like, it's not good enough. They have to take proactive steps to deliberately and intentionally obstruct you. Again, to, the, to, the, to her own detriment, because she's going to start getting dinged on appeal. So it's not like she's going to get go away from this unscathed. She's going to start getting, you know, hit from above. The Court of Appeals will start taking care of these problems for me. But it's like, why? Like, why put so much work into protecting the person who's obviously breaking all the rules. She's not complying with turning over the address. She's not complying with child support, even after you just protected her by denying my request to proceed with a debtor's exam. All of this stuff, to me, makes no sense at all. But somehow, some way, in this judge's head, she can make sense of it. Um, again, guys, this goes to the problem of discretion. This explains why I don't think that the solution to child custody issues is to give the judges wide latitude. The solution, in my opinion, is to control the judiciary through strict statutory language. Basically, bind them down with the chains of the statutes, the precedent, the court rules, etc. Um, if you want to learn more about why this is such a problem, watch my video on the topic, Discretion.